Khair for attending this talk. This is our first talk entitled Deen or Dunya of a five part series entitled the Hereafter series. Our talk for today is going to be discussing our purpose of life and whether we should be focusing on the materialistic issues of this life or should our focus and aim be to strive for the hereafter. Allah mentions in the Quran, Bal al hayat al dunya. Rather you prefer the life of this world. You, wanna, you don't want to let go of your assets, the wealth that you have and your honor and status of this world. Wal akhiratu khayrun wa abqa. Rather, although the hereafter is better and more lasting. There's a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Man ahabba dunyahu atarra bi akhiratihi wa man ahabba akhiratahu atarra bi dunyahu fa'athiru ma yabqa ala ma yafna. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever loves his worldly life will suffer in the hereafter. And whoever loves his hereafter will suffer in the worldly life. Therefore choose that which is everlasting over that which is temporal. So our speaker for today is Ustad Jalali bin Said. He was born in Afghanistan, raised up in Houston, Texas. I don't know if you guys know Yusuf Estes. Yusuf Estes from uh, Texas, Numan Ali Khan, from the same era, Houston, Texas. Ustad came over to the UK, now resides here. He's very active within the Dawah scene. He has an organization called Al Fitra that runs courses, many projects going on, such as One Eid and has appeared on many different TV channels such as Muslim World Network and Ramadan TV as well. The program for today will have the talk, the speech, inshallah, and then straight after that we'll have a mini question answer session. There's some paper at the back for the sisters there if they just want to write their questions down and then at the end just pass them through. As for the brothers, we'll have some paper going around as well. Bismillah. <coughs> وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في الفرحان المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والرحمن إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا أما بعد فإن أستق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثات بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters, respected elders, guests, shuyukh السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Anyone not understand the opening khutbah al-hajjah, the Arabic? Don't be shy Anyone not understand? If you have, I'm going to ask you if you do that Most people hands slowly start going up. <laughs> it's so important, this opening sermon. It's hard for a speaker to even carry on after, to be quite open about it. It's because when you understand its meaning, it's weighty. There's nothing you can say after. It's like concise. 
And so it's important that I, well, I, I used to be there and I used to listen when I was studying in the Sheikh Salaam Alaikum. And the Sheikh would be speaking and he would start off with the Khutbat al Hajj and he'd start off with the opening dua. And everyone had the same attitude. Oh, it's nice, but when's he going to get to it? Come on, let's get started. Uh, just in a nutshell, I'll just paint a picture for you so you know what is said. Every time you hear it, just picture this image in a frame. You don't need to learn all the Arabic to know, just so you can feel what is being said. In Alhamdulillah. Allah does not need you and I to be here. He is praised without us, before us, beyond us. He doesn't need us. <coughs> That's the beginning. So there's no need to come as if you're offering. We come as beggars. <laughs> so be humble and praise Him. He doesn't need your praise, but praise Him. That's the right thing to do. If you don't know me, there's not much you can say about me. So how could one praise his Lord if he hasn't studied to get to know him? And he hasn't gotten closer to Allah? That's why most people when they say praise Allah, they'll say SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, and that's about it. They run out of things to say. How much can you praise Allah the Almighty? The more you get to know him, our Habib al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, SubhanAllah, one night his beloved wife is a little bit jealous. She's looking for him. She can't find him. He's missing in bed. She reaches over, he's not there. Where is he? She starts reaching out in the dark. And she reaches into the masjid and she finds his foot. She feels better. Alhamdulillah, he's here. He hasn't run off to someone else's house. She finds his foot. She touches it. It's in the shape like this. He knees in sajda. And she said, I heard him say, La Subhanallah. Rasulullah stood in salah, in prayer, until his feet cracked and bled, alayhi He prayed so much, he praised him so much, but on this occasion his beloved wife heard him say, La nusithan an malik. I can't praise you enough. I keep trying, I can't praise you enough. You are as you praise yourself. Only you can praise yourself enough. Nasta'inu. Ask him for help. Believers and disbelievers, <coughs> together, when they need something, exam times, game times for the little ones, food times for the hungry ones, we always look to each other and everyone else for help and support. Financial difficulties we call our friends. Looking and looking and looking until finally, you know, you're getting married maybe, you're looking for a spouse you can't find one, you're frustrated everywhere, until finally the person is so distraught that they just go to their knees and say, my Lord, help me. When really, Nasta'inu, who is on a daily, consistent basis, you're supposed to ask him for help only. And then seek solutions in people. And you find blessings in them. Nasta'afiru. When you forget to praise him. When you become arrogant. You know when you're walking, you kind of walk a little funny sometimes, especially the youth. You kind of have a little skip in there. I'm going to take on the world. A little attitude sometimes. That happens. You forget. And you forget to praise Allah and you forget to ask Him. So nastaghfiru, you ask Him to forgive you. And seek refuge in Him from the evils of who? <coughs> Everyone thinks it's shaitan. And there's nothing wrong with that answer. But really, the hadith says nafs, the nafs, the self. The evils we are capable of, they surprise shaitan himself. Even shaitan looks at man and thinks, I wouldn't have thought of that one. At times, shaitan might even say, Astaghfirullah, what is wrong with man? So we have to seek refuge in Allah from ourself, the first and foremost, and from the wickedness of our deeds. Even the good deeds can become wicked when we do it to show off or impress others than Allah Azza Whoever does these five simple things, seek refuge from the evils of the self, and the wickedness of deeds. Such people are guided and no one can misguide them because they stay connected to their Lord. But who, he who doesn't, there's no guiding such a person. He thinks he knows it all. I bear witness before all of you brothers and sisters and you will witness for me that I believe Allah is one and Muhammad is his final messenger. Allah commands us in the Quran that those who believe have conscious awareness, taqwa. 
Taqwa is translated as fear, but fear is not the right word. In Urdu they say dar, in Farsi they say tas. These things are scary, but that's not what taqwa means. Taqwa is deeper than that. Taqwa is consciously connected with those five things, always seeking Allah. Those people with taqwa have it until Allah is pleased with you. His rights over you. And we know His rights cannot be fulfilled. He is eternal. So we must always try. And don't you dare accept, don't you dare die except in the state of belief. We know the hadith from a Nawawi, Arba'ina Nawawi. I noticed a little message up there. I noticed someone studying it here. One of the beautiful collections of a hadith. We have this one hadith from um, Imam uh, Anawi. He collected Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that a believer may live pious and righteous most of his life. He may live pious and righteous most of his life and then that which is written for him takes him. Right at the end he gets frustrated, he gives up and he goes astray and he goes to hell. Or someone may live evil all his life and in his last moments he feels remorse and he changes and he is guided to Islam and he dies and goes to paradise. This is a reminder that there's no guarantee, so every day check yourself. Avoid newly invented matters in religion. These newly invented matters in religion, they have misguided the people before us. 124,000 Anbiya of Allah have been sent to the earth, and their people constantly gone back astray. People from Bani Israel, they've gone astray into many sects, many groups, many denominations. People from the Ahl Kitab and the Nasara, I should say specifically, have gone astray into so many different denominations and groups because of constantly changing, adding to it, and, and taking from the religion. And amongst Muslims, no different. They have parted into many, many different groups. Hezbiyah is prevalent. People are splitting up into different groups because they added to the religion and took from it. So avoid these things, else they are misguiding, and all that is misguiding, Valala finnar. It will take those people to the hellfire to proceed. And I'm not sure you get a feeling. So next time someone opens the reminder and they start with the khutbah al you kind of have a sense of what is being said. And just imagine those things and they should bring you close to Allah Azza wa Jal, inshaAllah. The deen and the dunya. The purpose of life is an interesting subject because I've given this lecture in, uh, ultimate, in many different venues and this reminder is very special to me because uh, it brings us back to our old days from the 90s and the 80s. We're talking Ahmadidat days, Rahimullah. We go back to the days of the original, what we call the kings of Dawah. Back in the day, you know, we had uh, Siraj Wahaj in America, his writings and his teachings. I mean, he's somewhat who is a personality in, in, in the West. And then we had others like uh, um, uh, the purpose of life who Khalid Yassin is known for the most. He began this whole lecture series on the purpose of life and whatnot. It affected many people. But with me personally, when it came down to the purpose of life, I found every single audience, the lecture changed. It was different, because everyone has a different purpose. Every group of people have a different reason to be here. And we as believers, we too, have a purpose. It doesn't stop at just becoming a Muslim. The purpose doesn't stop there. In fact, one of my favorite lessons from the, the ulama that I used to sit with, may Allah be pleased with all of them and keep them in good health and those that have passed, grant them jannah and for those, ameen. Amen. Those people who we learn from, they used to say, Islam is a slope like this. And ilm, the knowledge, there is no stagnancy in it. Stagnant water, it rots, it stinks, it starts to ferment, it becomes ugly. And in Islamic knowledge, it is the same. If it stays still, so you've learned to become a Muslim, and you stay there, you will rot. Your Iman, your Islam will rot. So will your knowledge. So you are either excelling, it won't stay there. If it starts to rot, you are going down. So you are either increasing with your Iman and your Islam and your knowledge, your purpose. You are getting closer and closer to the ultimate objective, or you are receding, you are slipping back. This lesson put things into perspective that how much do I study? 
when I remember the, uh, the early days when the youth used to say, I want to go and study, I want to study, I want to go away and learn. To what degree? Was there a limit? Like in high school, college, you graduate and it's over. In Islam, there is no ending. There are many brothers who went to Medina, we know, and they went to other Jamias, and when they graduated, mm -hmm. what then? Did anything change? No, they had to come right back to the beginning and start learning how to now implement that knowledge and how to share with other people. It continues. You don't stop learning. The purpose of life for a believer is that he's, let's start with the ultimate objective, and then we work our way back today, inshallah. We don't know if we're going to live tomorrow. We don't know if we're going to be here next week or next month. We have no guarantees that we'll be alive next month or next year even, or this Ramadan. We know many people last Ramadan that are not here for this Ramadan already. So there is no guarantee. Uh, one of my favorite hadith from Rasul <laughs> is when someone was making dua and he was asking for things. and We had different kind of situations. We have quite a few hadith relating to this where people would come and say, can I ask for this? Can I ask for that? And it's really sweet to see these Bedouins so excited that they now have a Lord who answers their supplications. So one even said, can I ask for a yellow camel? And Rasul said, yes, you can ask for a yellow camel. Can I ask for two? And he said, yes, you can ask for two. And he was very happy walking away. And he thought, wait a second, this is a very generous God. And he came back and said, can I ask for three? <laughs> and he said, yes, you can ask for three. And he thought, surely if one will give you three, he might give you four. So he came back and Rasulullah said, wait a second, let me tell you something. If you were to keep wishing and keep asking and keep asking and never stop, and all of the people on earth did the same. And all of the jinn, they all did the same. And Allah gave everyone everything all of them wished. He doesn't belittle or demean his kingdom, not even a drop from the ocean. Not even a needle being removed from the ocean. So he will give you. So ask. And from this comes the hadith when he said to the Sahaba, when you're going to make dua, uh, don't sell yourself short. <coughs> Ask for the best. And so today we set the purpose of our lives, the goal, the best thing we can achieve. And then we work from there, inshallah. We work our way back. So one of my teachers said to me, I asked him, in fact, I said, so when you say the best, ask for the best. Don't sell yourself short. What did you mean by that? He said, ever ask your dad for $50? Uh, pounds here. You ever ask your dad for fifty dollars? I said, sure. Um, how much did he give you? I said, twenty. <laughs> exactly. But had you asked for a hundred, he might have given you fifty. So always ask for more, seek more. And with Allah, don't settle for just what. Oh Allah, give me a wife, a good wife. Oh Allah, give me a house. Oh Allah, give me four camels. Don't sell yourself short. Ask for the best and you will have everything below it. And what can we ask for that is the best, Ya Rasulullah? He said, ask for Al-A'la, Jannat Al-A'la, the highest. For those Al-A'la, the peak of Jannat. Don't ask for Jannah, ask for Jannat, plural. And don't ask for just Jannat, for those Al-A'la, ask for the highest. You're going to make dua for something before you finish. Oh Allah, give me for those Al-A'la. The rest comes below it. <coughs> Always aim for the best. And in our purpose of life, why we are here, we know the basics. Let's get them out the way. I have not created the jinn and the man except for my worship. And in his worship, this is important because we're at the next level now. That is what I would say to someone who wants to know what's the purpose of life so that they will become Muslim tomorrow. And they do. Last night we had two shahadas. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, tabarakallah. And I've always mocked Muslims' response to shahadas. You know, in the old days, you used, someone took shahada, there'd be a long line of people standing waiting to hug and say congratulations. And it was an incredible feeling thinking, hang on a second, I see that white man became Muslim, so Islam must be the truth. It was almost like it was confirmation, it was a weakness of Iman. And it's prevalent today. I had two people come from the audience saying, you pressured those two into becoming Muslim. I almost like they disbelieved that two would want to be Muslim. And this is, this is the weakness of Iman that we have to work on. So once we are in the threshold of Islam, the purpose, it grows. It continues that we are commanded, you are created for only the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
And the ayah the brother mentioned earlier, I'll get to in just a minute, but that is just the perfect depiction of what worship is. First and foremost, another lesson one of the ulama taught, what is ibadah, the worship, what is it, how do you define it? Salah, Allah says it's not salah, azza wa jal. In the Quran he said, you praying, looking to the east and the west, this is not faith. So that's not enough, there's something else. And it comes down to simplicity. What is the simple nature of man? You do what you want or you don't do what you want. You obey or you don't obey. That is worship. And it, uh, subhanAllah, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawzir, he is known as Tabib al-Qalb, the doctor of the heart. This is what he focused on. How do you feel? Feeling love, romance? This is the man to talk to. He was Dr. Love. And he could tell you everything about the qulub, the heart. And he would tell you how you're feeling. Feeling like getting married? He'd tell you why. And he'd embarrass you. And he was beautiful. So one of the things he explained about shirk even, with the heart, he said this obedience. <laughs> one of the most filthiest, despicable types of minor shirk is the obedience to the nafs. That you choose it over your Lord. That you make your nafs a God above God. Allah has told you don't do something, your desires say just, just try it. So you give in to the shahawat and you go do this. And what do the shahawat cause? When you give in to the desires and you feed it, what does that do to the nafs? Makes it fat, just like the stomach. When we eat, we get fatter. It's not nice, horrible feeling. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable myself. When you eat, you get a little fatter. The next thing you know, your nafs is looking at the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And that puts black spots on the heart. And as the heart gets... You know, some people have a question about what the heart is. Is it actually this piece of flesh? Maybe. Is it the soul? Maybe. Or is it just the fitrah? The natural disposition of good in a person. Well, that is definitely in the heart, whatever it is. So the fitrah will tell you right from wrong. And that is when you know to obey or not obey. Some people might say, I didn't have knowledge. Knowledge is secondary to this. To obedience to Allah, the first thing is that belief. So a person says, I want to know, like a man actually came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is, this, is what, this is where we are, a lot of us today. I don't have knowledge, brother. I don't know. I'm not sure. At home, we make excuses to ourselves. I didn't know. I'm not sure. Maybe. Let's just look the other way for now. A man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he said, Ya Rasulullah, this thing I want to do. I want to do this thing, but I'm not sure. What do you think? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa beautifully said to him, Tell me, what does your heart say? I don't have knowledge. I don't know. No, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to tell me. Just bluntly say, I'll obey. These people would have jumped at his... If the Prophet spat, they would jump to catch it. They would obey. They loved him. So he said, just, just say it and I'll just do it. It'll help me. It'll help me overcome my nafs. What does your heart tell you? Ya Rasulullah, please just tell me. Right or wrong? Should I or shouldn't I? I just need to know clarity. What is it your heart is saying to you? He stressed the heart so much, the fitrah. The man said, it doesn't feel right. He goes, the wavering heart will never lie to you. Your heart is telling you this is bad. And that's where it starts. When you feel something is wrong, it is wrong. And you start there. Obedience is worship. And where do we fail most as believers? What is our ultimate objective? Jannat al-A'la. We said that. And how do you get there? What is Jannah made of? Jannah is made of Ridwan, from Allah Himself, from His own pleasures. Our pleasures are limited. How much can we enjoy? But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala creates so much more in Al Jannat. So there, Allah Azza wa Jalla has given us His pleasure. And the ultimate believer, the goal that is set to get to that level, is to seek the pleasure of Allah. And the pleasure of Allah is found in obedience. And when we fail in obedience, comes the purpose of life again. What do we do? This is why we were created. Let's take a moment back. Step back just a bit. Everyone just kind of take a deep breath. Don't be shy. Take a deep breath. You know when you breathe short breaths, you know what that creates? Tense oxygen. <laughs> it makes it very tense. Just take a deep breath. Give the brain some oxygen because this is weighty information as it comes to us. We pray Allah Azza wa Jal puts it in our heart and lets us understand faham and then implement. Amin. Say Amin. So anyways, this, uh, the purpose of life comes to this. When we slip, when we fail, when we forget, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with our purpose. And it goes from birth 
to the ultimate objective of paradise, Allah's pleasure, or the ultimate bliss of ignorance, which is Jahannam. A'udhu Billah. The way Allah created us, let's start there for just a moment, as believers. He created us insan. Ever heard the phrase? Uh, oh, before I tell you the phrase, you go home, you get into fights with your wife, suppose you're married. Yeah? Problems at home sometimes? Yes! Don't be shy. Yes, we have problems at home. Yeah, we, if you have a wife, you got a problem. <laughs> if she's got a husband, she's got a problem. So let's be fair. Okay? We, you know, the son of man, the son of Adam, you know, he quarrels. And when we get into these arguments at home and we have these problems at home or... Uh, it is because we are insan, and when we have these problems, what do we say when the wife says, you said such and such, I expected so much. Or the husband says that to the wife. Or how about friends, or how about in business? People are saying, but you said, but you said. Kids are the best. But dad, you said, but you said. And always taking us to our word. And our response is, I'm only human. I'm only human. When we say, forgive me, I'm only human. This is insan. Insan is forgetful. The root of the word, in fact, is one who forgets. And there's nobody, Muslim or none, that will deny the fact that he is forgetful. And he does slip and he does forget. So first and foremost, Allah has created us forgetful. And we will slip and we will forget. <coughs> Second thing is that he has given us enough, the desires. The desires are important because when you get hungry, you need something to tell you. You need food. You, when, you're, when you're of age and you need to get married, you need something to tell you. Hey, look for a wife, not just any wife, one you like. Look for a husband, one you like, etc. And, and children eventually, I want kids, or I want this, I want that. The nafs will tell you all kinds of silly things. And you do these things and then you question yourself afterwards. When the nafs is full, it will ask for things that are not good for it, and it will slip. After creating us forgetful, then putting within us the nafs, then he has surrounded us with fatana. As we know, the famous hadith, Jibreel alayhi salam was sent to look at Jannat, and it was surrounded by hardships and difficulties. And he feared no one would go here. First he saw it for what it was, and he said, everyone's going here, Ya Allah. He saw Jahannam, no one wants to go there. Then he saw the Jahannam surrounded by pleasures, desires, and Jannah surrounded by hardships. He said, oh Allah, no one's going to Jannah, everyone's going to Jahannam. Because everyone's going to want this. Their nafs is going to want this. Why? Because Jibreel knew the free will, the desires that was in the jinn is now inside the human. He will do the same thing. He will want to do these desires and he will want to slip into them. So Allah created us, one, forgetful of who we are, where we're supposed to go. Two, full of this shahwat, the desires. Three, the fitna of fulfilling the desires surrounding us. Do you see the difficulty here? Constantly, man will slip no matter at what level. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he put the purpose of life or the purpose of a believer in perspective when he said, Kullu ibni Adam Every son of Adam will slip into his desires, will slip into these wrong things and commit crimes. So what I'm trying to say is first and foremost, to defeat shaitan at his own game, his biggest plot against you and I, shaitan's biggest game against us is to make us turn against Allah. Not commit crimes and those things, that comes sec that's, that's small things to him. But to actually despair and to actually loathe and hate ourselves and think, I am filthy, my sins are great, I am the worst thing in the world. When shaitan does these things, you remember the purpose that we're created for, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us this way, so we will turn to his maghfirah, to his mercy, to his forgiveness, to his guidance. Allah azza wa jal created us for this very purpose. He has malaika, countless number of malaika that serve him, obey him. He has creatures and creations everywhere worshipping him perfectly. As we said, in alhamdulillah. He is praised without us. Allah is not in need of us. So everything is perfect. So thus he created you and I for the purpose of needing to turn back. And Allah says in the Quran, فَفِرْوِ Allah. Run, don't walk. 
Don't think about it. Flee back. Even now while I'm speaking, don't be shy in your heart and in your mind to remember those sins that have harmed you, the black spots in your heart. Dig them out and talk about them to your Lord. In your thoughts even, bring them out. He says, Fafirru, run back, flee back to Allah. Come back to your Lord because of harm from shaitan, from his waswas, from all of this. The purpose of a believer's life, once he comes to Islam, is that now he must constantly, consistently, forever, constantly go back to Allah daily. And we have this lesson in the Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was perfect, who was masum, who was someone who did not sin. In fact, even if he had, he was told your future and passions are forgiven. He is Rasul. He is guaranteed Jannah. But yet he would sit in a gathering before getting up. They would witness that he said Astaghfirullah a hundred times at least. This was lesson for you and I. That we need to say Astaghfirullah in a hundred times and at least in one sitting. Subhanallah, do we say a hundred times Astaghfirullah even in one day? How about in a week? How about in a month? Some people don't say it in a year a hundred times. Rasul Sallallahu said it a hundred times in one sitting, showing us the crucial importance of constantly turning back to Salah, turning back to Dua, turning back to Allah Azza wa Jal. That is the purpose of the believer as an individual. I'm not talking about a collective. There are many purposes, but as you and I, as individuals, what is your purpose as a Muslim? Do you need to wait for a Khalifa to tell you? Do you need an Islamic utopia? Do you need to be living in a masjid? No, wherever you are, Kullu ibn Adam al-Khattab, every son of Adam slips in sins, and his job and his role is worship. For the worship of Allah you were created, and that is within the ta'a, the obedience, where you slip, you constantly repent, tawbah. Who else will Allah forgive? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infinite mercies and beauties and grandeur and powers. They're infinite. And one of them is forgiveness. Another one is pardoning, erasing. Another one is acceptance of tawbah. He has a tawab. And there are many more like this. Many more attributes. Who does he spend those on? The angels? In fact, it is a hadith that says, if you did not slip, you did not sin, you did not worship Allah, you did not go back to him and make tawbah, Allah would erase you, create something else that would sin, that would slip, that would go back and repent and ask Allah to forgive him. That is the very purpose of creation of man. That he turned back to Allah. Everything that is created by Allah, its purpose is ibadah. Everything. But their worship is different. Our worship is tawbah. It's constantly checking. Humility. This beautiful ayah the brother recited earlier. In this beauty, one, you know, in fact, it's a need. It's in the desires as well. It's in the fitrah as well. The need to repent. The need to be purified. Because you know when you commit a sin, it's a horrible feeling. You don't want to carry it on your shoulder. It's like a bill you haven't paid. Bailiffs are coming eventually. It's a horrible feeling. When that red letter comes in the stamp, warning, last final reminder, <laughs> horrible. When Malik al-Mut looks at us every single day, that's a scary feeling. So that's the last moment to decide what's, what am I going to do. And in this verse, قَدْ أَفْلَهَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وَذَكَرَ أَسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى فَلْتُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا It's in you. You want to be purified? Allah loves purifying you. More than you want to be, more than you want to get rid of that debt, Allah wants to get rid of it for you. More than you seek His pleasure, He wants to be pleased with you. More than you want Jannah, He wants you in Jannah. More than you desire it, He desires it. Our desire is weak, Allah's desire is immense. And He wants us in Jannah and He wants us happy. He wants us pleased. He wants us in a good state. I have not sent Islam for you to make things difficult. Nay, they have been to make things easier, better for you. The Prophets of Allah, the Anbiya of Allah, they were sent with two things. They were sent with number one, Basira. Glad tidings, good news. Basira, Basira, Basira. They brought good news and they brought what else? Bad news. Not bad, a warning of bad news. The believers Allah loves so much, there's no bad news for the believer. There's nothing bad. It's just, hey, it can get bad. If you're not careful, you start off with basira, glad tidings. Wabashir al mu'minin, wabashir al muhsinin, wabashir al muslimin. Glad tidings. These verses all over the Quran. 
The only thing that distracts you is that you keep clinging to the dunya. And these verses give comfort because Allah is saying the Akhirah is so much better if only you knew. And I've been saying this to people of old, the script in the scriptures of Ibrahim and Musa. And when we go back to the old days, you find all the Anbiya of Allah doing the same thing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Astaghfirullah a hundred times in one gathering. In fact, in Taif, when he was pelted and bleeding and wounded, he fell in sujood and he made dua. He said, oh Allah, long as you are not upset, this is okay. Else who have you given me to? Else who have you handed me to? Not you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Else, who have you given me to the people of life? Look what's happened to me. Look what they're doing to me. But if you're upset, then this is fine. Let's purify quick. But if you're not upset, and that is when the young boy from Najd came, and he came and he and he brought him grapes and water, and the boy heard Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say one thing: Bismillah. This is wait. This is Ajib. You people, the Quraysh, they don't say this. And he said, where are you from? He said, I'm from such and such. Ah, the land of Jonah, my brother. You know Jonah? He was a Christian boy, Arab Christian. Ever heard an Arab Christian? It's beautiful. They sit there saying, mashallah, subhanahu alhamdulillah, all day long, you think they're Muslim? They're almost there. And this kid said that. He said, hey, you don't say bismillah. You people don't. The Christian Arabs used to say bismillah before we did. And so he said this, this is Jonah. All oh, your brothers, all oh, this is a prophet. Ah. He kissed Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, took his shahad, became Muslim. And this was a sign from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Allah, not angry, but I didn't tell you to leave Mecca. I didn't tell Jonah to leave his people, I didn't tell you to leave your people, go back. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went back and was given Medina or Yathrib overnight. Just from that obedience. When you go back to Allah, the answer is there. The Yusra is there, the blessings are there. The goodness is there, waiting. Anyways, my brothers in Islam, the prophets are an example. Going back from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he made tawbah there. Going back all the way to the beginning, Adam. Oh, Subhanallah, you made a mistake. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa illam taqfilna wa tarhamna la nakuna min al khasiri. He said, Oh my Lord, I have wronged me. I have done something. But if you don't forgive me, if you don't have mercy on me, I am surely with the losers. He repented, made tawbah. And he's a prophet, the first man on earth. And it carries on. No, my son, my son, Ya Allah, you said my family, my son. A father who sees his son drown, he's going to be in shock. He watched his son. So he complained. And Allah says, don't ask about that which you do not know. I.e., you love him as your son. I love him as my creation. I love him far more than you. He didn't choose your boat, so he drowned. He didn't choose my Jannah, wants Jahannam instead. Allah was far more upset than Nuh, and Nuh fell in sujood and made tawbah, Allah forgive me for what I didn't know. Musa, oh Allah show me, show me. Allah showed him and the mountain exploded. Allah said, stop asking what you don't know. Oh Allah, please show me. So Allah showed him and the mountain exploded. Musa said, I'm sorry. Astaghfirullah. I should have known better. May tawbah. <coughs> Yusuf, his father, Yaqub, Allahu Akbar, Israel, Yaqub. He said only the disbeliever would think Allah does not forgive and Allah does not want good for you. It's disbelief to think that. That Allah, oh I've sinned and Allah wants to punish me. A'udhu <laughs> billah. Who are you? What is your filthy sin? That Allah, why? He has, in his busy schedule, the things he's got, and Allah is unlimited and he can do what he wants. He take time just to punish you? Like that's what he created you for? No. That is not our purpose to be punished. We are not created to suffer. That is not our purpose. Our purpose is to be happy. And there's more in that in a moment, inshallah. Moving on to Yusuf, who made tawbah. Yusuf Rasul Sallallahu himself said, when the people of the prison, the king sent the people to come and free Yusuf from the prison, Yusuf refused to go, said, ask the women about me first. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, I don't have that sabr Yusuf had. If they opened the door for me, I'd be gone. I would have walked out after seven years. Yusuf, still in that state, made tawbah, repented. And this carries on every prophet. Musa repented. Ibrahim making the Kaaba doing good deeds with his son. They're walking around building the Kaaba. And they're making dua and praising Allah and saying, forgive us our sins. Every prophet. 
doing the same thing. The very purpose of every believer. Every single thing else you can think of. All the other purposes that you can possibly achieve. They can only be achieved if you're strong, healthy, with Iman, and able. And you can't be any of those things unless you first establish your connection with Allah. And you establish that tawbah and that purification. And those verses are so beautiful. Allah says, who else is going to forgive you? Why won't you ask Allah to forgive you? Why won't you ask me to forgive you? Wallahu ghafoor rahim. Allah is so full of, ready and full of forgiveness to forgive you. Ghafiru dhambi wa qabiru tawb. That's what I do. I forgive sins. I accept repentance. The purpose of believers' lives today is to establish that connection on a daily, consistent basis. And when you slip and when you forget, fafirru, run back. And the most beloved moment in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal is when you're running. It is not when a person is so pious he's never sinned. No. That's normal. But it's when you sin and you've gone so far and your mind can't help but remember that's where you want to be. And you turn around and you run back to him. That is the most beloved moment to Allah. And that person is elevated. And one of my favorite hadith about Yom Al-Qiyamah, in fact, you know Yom Al-Qiyamah, right? We're not going to talk about that now, but wow. Yom Al-Qiyamah has so many nicknames because it's so scary. Just one example is that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know people, I've heard people say, Astaghfirullah, I'll see you on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Like, what kind of, oh my God, who are you? <coughs> Day of judgment, you're going to come out naked, uncircumcised, and you're going to tell everyone, hold on, hold on, get that brother, I have a problem with him. Really? That day is going to be a day of panic. And Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, naked? Won't people notice? And he became so emotional, said, Oh, Aisha, that day is so severe. People won't notice themselves naked, much less anyone else. You will be in horror. On that horrible day, there is a small group of people that will be laughing. Laughing, Rasulullah said. Sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, Because... People will ask them, they will say, why are you laughing on this day? Look at the mess we're in. And they will say, because we committed sins. <laughs> and because of our sins, we're going Jannah. And that's why we're laughing. Because they made tawbah. <coughs> Ibn Adam khata, every son of Adam sins, but the most beloved of people on earth to Allah, khayrul khata'in. The best of mankind, a tawabun, are those who keep making tawbah, keep turning back to him, and he forgives them, and he forgives them, and he loves to forgive. Inna Allah yuhibbul tawabin. You fall in love with someone, Allah falls in love with you because you made tawbah. Inna Allah yuhibbul tawabin. Inna Allah yuhibbul mutatahirin. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsinin. He's in love with those who keep doing these good deeds. And what is the best deed? Tawbah. The sin becomes a good deed. The sin will take someone to Jannah. Long as, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, tuba illallahi, tawba tanna suha. Long as it is sincere for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. The purpose is many. The purposes are many, I know. But as an individual today, what can we take away? I could sit here and talk about lots of things, from dawah to working with the elderly to... <coughs> Lots of things you can do. The believers have many purposes as a collective body. But as an individual, what can you take away with you today? Is you could come back in here every day a little bit brighter, a little bit stronger, a little bit better. If every day you were to just take account and repent. One of the youngsters came to Rasulullah ﷺ. Rasulullah said to the Sahaba, ask me, I'll tell you. And this was scary when Rasulullah said that. And the Sahaba would shy, they should go quiet. Because he's saying this is wahi. Ask me, I'll tell you that. Do you really want to know? You know, the day of my death, I want to know. Do you really want to know? What will happen? It's like, do you really, can you handle it? So he said, ask me today, I will tell you. Ask me today, I will tell you. And Qadrullah, one, yeah, one uh, man came forward and said, tell me where will I be in the Akhirah? And he said, you? Allahu Akbar. The 
the man said, what have I done? What do I do? And he said, it is the small sins you neglect like flies in your face. You do small things every day, and you think they're no big deal. And when you build a campfire, you don't build it with big logs. You build it with twigs. So these small sins, they're like twigs. And when they are collected for you on Yom al Qiyamah, they'll make a fierce blaze. And this is for those who don't take account daily. Because in two days, you're going to forget what small things you did two days ago. Because they were small. Constant, constant toba for things you remember and things you don't remember. Constant, constant reflection. And the beauty I come back to over and over. The beauty of it all is it's easy. It's guaranteed. Allah will definitely forgive. Do you know the actions of a Muslim? Anything you do, can you guarantee that you are sincere? Can anyone guarantee sincerity? Can you look in your heart and say, I'm sincere? No. Nobody can, except one action. There is one action that is guaranteed sincerely for the sake of Allah. Do you know what that is? The dua, the tawbah. When you call upon Allah, there is no other reason except you are directly talking to Him, and the dua is 100% accepted and responded to. Even the disbeliever's dua is responded to. Even the kafir, when he makes du'a, he is responded to. Even when the kafir makes du'a to an idol, even that du'a is responded to at times. And on Yom Al-Qiyamah, it will be witness against them, of course. But there is a point that Allah Azza wa Jal does not refuse the du'a of any slave. Sometimes you don't even need to make du'a. You upset somebody. Later you're walking and you trip. Because that person made no du'a, but his heart was in pain. Allah listens to the du'a even from the heart, before you've even uttered it. How many times have you made tawbah and you began to repent, you began to count your sin, you began to turn to Allah, and you know the, the beautiful ayah, think of me, I'll think of you. You've just begun, and already the tears start welling up, the nose starts to burn, the emotions start to build, you just turn to Him. This is khushu that comes from when you think of Him, He says, I will think of you. Mention me in a gathering, I will mention you by name to the malaika. Off topic. Something I love sharing, the beautiful hadith, when brothers gather and they remember Allah Azza wa Jal, the malaika, they circle. Why? See, many people heard this hadith. How many of you heard that hadith? Yes? Most of us. But I'm going to tell you a story and I'd like you to tell me at the end if you've ever heard it like this. Because this is this just mind-boggling. The angels surround, more come from a distance, they see the light. Why, are, why is there a collection? Like, you know, youth today, they go out and they see a bunch of youth, they must be doing something funny. So I call, there's a lot of youth, maybe something good's going on, they go rushing there. Or a marketplace, ah, something's cheap, let me go. go to the mall. Women, if three women come around us of, of some kind of an item, five more will come. Might be cheap, might be on sale. And that's what happens, it's like you think, it's the nature of man. Something's going on. Well, with angels, it's the same, except in ibadah. They see angels gathering, something good is going on. So from a distance, they come running. And this is a beautiful story, because you know when uh, Eunice, Jonah, when he was in the belly of the whale, he, uh, made, he made dua, and he made tawbah. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min Over and over and over and over and over. And this dua made a light from the whale to the heavens. And angels from a distance saw this light. And they haven't even seen who it is. It's in the belly of the whale. And the malaika intercede and they come to Allah. The prayer of Yunus. Like, what do you answer? It's been three days. He's been begging. What do you answer? And this is because of the style of beauty of dua that the angels recognized. It must be Yunus. I.e., this is the way the angels look at us. That is why they come rushing together in circle. All the way to the heavens. Why? Why did the angels do this? Let's carry on. There's more reason why. More come, there's no more space. They're not shy. They push another angel and they step on top of him. And they stack on top of each other all the way to the heavens. And there is no hadith, no ayah that I have found yet that talks about angels stacking on top of each other for any other reason except for when people gather to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. No other reason, not even jihad, nothing. Only when you gather to remember Allah, the malaika frantically circle all the way to the heavens. And when they get to the heavens, Allah is saying, What's going on? Why have they gathered? They praise you. Have they seen me? This is like, you know, shy, embarrassing for the angels. Because they see him. No, they don't see him. 
What if they saw me? Oh, much more. What else they say? They're grateful for dunya. You know what dunya is, right? Dunya is like the low part, the lower part of the low, lowly. The bottom of the bottom is dunya. That's what they're saying thank you for? What if they saw what I, I have waiting for them? Oh, they'd be more grateful. What else? Allahu Akbar. Have they seen my quwa, my power, my ability? This hadith is so beautiful, it carries on until finally the angels are just mind-boggled by, by what? What mind-boggles them? Two things. One is how pleased Allah is. Allah is so happy that they're just like, wow! Because that's what makes their day, that Allah is happy. When you get to see Allah's pleasure, it's like eating ice cream of another level. It's like enjoyment of another level. There's just no words to describe it. That Allah is happy. That's amazing. So these angels say to Allah, Oh Allah, reward them, reward them, reward them. What shall I reward them? The best thing you know. Then I forgive them. But everyone today, you leave here forgiven. And you have to believe that. If you're a Muslim, you believe that. Don't leave here thinking, oh, not me. No, you. By name, Allah mentioned to them. Now, the second reason. First, they're excited because of Allah's pleasure. The second reason is the most important part for me. This is what amazes me. Remember in the beginning of time, when Allah said in the Quran, 50,000 years before creation, we wrote everything. Yeah, beautiful. And then he said, he commanded the angels to go get the clay from the earth. What did the angels say? Anyone? The angels, they had a... Yes, what did they say? Um... They uh, they were like whining to Allah, saying, well, what, uh, why do we have to go something Why like man? Something like that. Okay, something like that. Well, they didn't whine, but they said to Allah, yes. They said, oh Allah, why do you want to create something that's going to disobey you? Because they knew man, free will, desires from the jinn, that man will disobey, shed blood, commit mischief. Why, oh Allah? And Allah said, you don't know what I know. Today, right now, right now, the angels are up there. And they know we're created how? Forgetful. Weak. Created how? With lots of desires. And with what? Surrounded by fitna of those desires. And within all of that, everyone being freedom. You know, they're screaming freedom all around us. Going to Jahiliya, doing whatever they want. There's one or two or a handful that are doing this. Controlling them, their minds. Controlling their nafs. Controlling themselves. The angels find this amazing. They're like, wow. And they get surprised by these individual people, so they praise us to Allah saying, this is incredible, I didn't expect that. Because we thought they would only do evil. And amongst them, they don't even see you when they praise you. May Allah Azza wa accept this gathering. As Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, you take from the dunya, take from the Jannah as well. Meaning now. And the Sahaba said, where is the garden of Jannah here on earth? He said, when you remember Allah in a gathering, that is the garden of paradise. May Allah make this the garden of paradise for all of us. And make it a place we meet in the Akhirah, in Jannat al-Fidus al-A'la. All of us with the Anbiya of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that place is so massive, don't think it'll get crowded. It's massive so all of us can go, inshallah. May Allah grant it to all of us. And enable us to become vehicles and vessels for Allah's deen to spread to others because remember when the angel was sent to destroy a town one of the people in the village in the town was a pious man a devout man or a devout I should say and Allah said destroy him first for not sharing that knowledge because he left everyone else astray this is not a religion of arrogance this is not a religion of nationalism this is not a religion that belongs to me or to you this religion is an amana that we do the best we can with it, and we share it in the most beautiful ways. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the most beautiful way you can share it is by being an example. Take what you know and make it an example. Anything correct I've said is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I've said incorrect is from me. May Allah forgive me for saying it and make you forget I said it.